Good evening everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for the Working Mums Masterclass webinar uh, talking about managing meal times with Susan Austin from Frostbite. Thank you very much for taking the time to come along um, and take the time out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate it. Um, just to get going, um, I want to go through some housekeeping with you guys first of all. So the first thing I need to let you know is that we are actually recording this webinar. Um, so we do have to, by law, disclose that. And we'll have a recording of the webinar up on the Working Mums Masterclass website, normally within five to seven days, um, but I'll put a post up on Facebook when that's um, up. And something to remember is that you can hear us, but we can't actually hear you. But if you want to interact with us, and by all means, we, we thoroughly um, encourage you guys talking amongst each other and also asking questions, you can use the question box on the bottom right-hand side of your control panel or the chat box on the bottom right-hand side of the control panel as well. Um, so if you like, we can do a, a test and... Um, if you can answer the question in the question area, what did you guys have for dinner tonight? And type away and let me know what you had for dinner, just to make sure that you guys can work on that. Brilliant. Ah, oh, lovely. It's working. Everyone's is popping up. Oh, pizza dillers. wonder what they are. Burgers, chicken risotto, veggie risotto, pasta tuna and sour cream. Um, I'm on the Veggie Mama Veggie Challenge, week-long veggie challenge at the moment, and I'm loving it. We're going really, really well. Um, tonight was Mexican lasagna with no meat, so um, check out the blog if you want to have a look at that. All right, so just some technical um, advice for you. If you have any technical problems, there's a landline number there for you, the 1800 356 792 um, is the Citrix landline number. If you are using um, your internet to listen in to us and the connection keeps dropping in and out, there's actually a landline phone number on the email registration that was sent through to you. And you can call that and quite often that is, um, that's less prone to, to dropping out. Uh, like I said, use the chat box on the right to comment and ask any questions and I'll um, feed the questions, no pun intended, to Susan. As we go along, enjoy yourself. If you're tweeting, um, the hashtag is WMM Webinar. All right, let's keep going. So I'd like to introduce you to Susan Austin, who is the author of Frostbite, which is a fabulous book, which she'll tell you all about um, on tips on how to get the most out of your freeze up, um, pretty much. Susan came and presented at our Sydney Working Mums event in April and was really popular and um, really connected with the, the mums who came along. And she is a working mum herself and actually working full time at the moment. So juggling quite a bit. So she definitely knows, um, certainly knows the challenges that we all face. Um, Susan, I'd like to hand over to you. And um, if you tell us about a little bit about yourself, that'd be great. Thank you, Penny. Thank you so much for having me. And hello to everyone out there. Um, it's a bit weird from this end, just talking to myself and looking at a screen. So I hope someone's actually there on the other end. Um, I just want to say thank you, Penny, for having this and hosting this event. And I think it's great that you offer these free services to mums out there. And, and you can do it at home and the kids are sleeping and you're in your pyjamas. <laughs> I'm actually in my pyjamas. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really great of you, Penny, to, to run these things. And also, like Penny said, please use the question and comment chatting feature because um, it's much nicer when there's a conversation going on rather than just me talking. And I'd also like to say, if I'm talking too fast, which I tend to do, please let me know because um, yeah, I just tend to get a bit carried away. You can't see the hands flapping everywhere, but I can tell you when I was presenting at um, Hunters Hill in Sydney, I had the arms flying all over the place. <laughs> Just uh, about myself. Um, even though I've written cookbooks, I'm not a chef. I'm just a regular mum who happens to like cookbooks. Um, my background is actually as an accountant, believe it or not. And um, 
So I'm very numbery, very meticulous and ordered, and um, just wanted to say that not all of, all of us accountants are boring. We do have other hobbies and interests. And so with that background, I uh, DuPont Australia and Arthur Anderson, which is a huge um, international accounting firm, which no longer exists, but it's like working for KPMG. And um, then I went to a very, very small business. I went to work for a shop in Sydney called Accoutrement, which is um, an amazing kitchen store where they have everything you could possibly need for cooking. They have gorgeous gourmet foods and they run a cooking school from there. And it was a bit of a change in career. Um, the reason why I went there was mainly because I love cooking, but also it was, um, it was May in 2000 and GST was about to be introduced. So they needed someone who had a bit of a financial background so they could get ready for GST. So that suited me and I went and worked there. The only thing is I fell pregnant straight away. So um, I wasn't working the shop for too long. After 12 months I stopped working full time and had three beautiful baby girls, which you can see in that picture there, all dressed up for Halloween. Um, I should point out I'm not a big Halloween person, but we happen to live on the Halloween street in my neighbourhood, so we kind of have to embrace it. <laughs> anyway, so they're all dressed there, um, and while, yeah, while they were babies, I kept working for a coach month doing their bookkeeping for another four years or so. So, um, so yeah, the, the oldest one... Some of it was bookkeeping work, um, some, of, some of it was um, my books, I'll tell you about that in a second. And we also moved to Singapore for two years as well. Anyway, and so after doing all those things and my kids are all well established at school, I figured it's time to, to get back into the corporate world. So um, nearly three months ago I started working full time and I'm now at American Express in the city. So it's great fun, good to be back in the in the suits and high heels again, uh, but it's it's all a bit more of a juggle. Now, so talking about the, the cookbooks, what happened there was um, I've always loved cooking and always uh, always liked to be organised, and I did always freeze little bits and pieces, but nothing too radical, just your usual spaghetti bolognese and things. And and then one day I had this sort of literally a light bulb moment. I suddenly thought I see all these. I see snippets in different uh, magazines and cookbooks that say this can freeze and this can freeze. And I thought, I haven't actually seen it written as a, like a whole book on it. So, you know, boring, meticulous accounting me, <laughs> did my research, and I uh, went online and found out there was actually a huge genre of freezing cookbooks in America. And there were a few in England as well. So I thought, well, that's, that's an opportunity. And being married to another accountant, um, <laughs> You know, I know what he's like. He wouldn't want me wasting a whole lot of time on some bad business idea, but this had true potential. Um, not that it's been a wildly, you know, wildly successful money-raising venture, but more than anything, it's been exciting, and it's been um, I've had some great life experiences from writing cookbooks, you know, TV appearances, and anyway, and lots lots of fun things as well as being very flexible around my kids. So the first book you see is the one with the white writing. That one came out um, when my youngest was three months old, so that was a bit of a crazy time. And then the next book, which is the rainbow writing, that one is called The Frostbite for Toddlers to Teenagers. And that one came out while we lived in Singapore. So neither book came out at a particularly great time for me to promote them properly. And we came back from Singapore, and my publisher said, why don't we do it again, but do a best of volume. So they, that's what they did. We, we went through both books, pulled out all the, the best recipes, and also they not only not only were the recipes a really good mix because it was all the stellar recipes from the two books, but they finally got their cover right. They've got this fantastic fridge look, and they also went hardcover. So I was really excited when the third book came out because it was just a great product um, from the other two books. And also I was at a stage when I thought. Now I can properly promote it, so I gave up my crappy little um, admin accounting job that I was doing at the time and focused on the book full time. And I was doing all the, the Facebooks and the blogs and started twittering and you anyway, know doing all those things and setting up the social media side of it and and having a great time. But to be honest, not making any money, but it was lots of fun. So um, 
So that's the story about the books, and and so bizarrely, I'm now considered Australia's subject matter expert on freezing. <laughs> um, I'm quite happy to be that person. I actually know more than you would believe about freezing. <laughs> I want to point out that when I, you know, I'm obviously very keen on freezing, but I always say to people, freezing's not the be all and end all. You don't have to freeze everything. Um, it's just just use it where it makes your life a little bit easier because we all have crazy lives and we all need a few shortcuts and we all need some ways of doing things smarter and um, so yes, yeah, why not use green because as our mothers did and our mothers did so I don't know quite why we missed out on that learning experience but that's where I step in. Um, anyway, so Penny would like me to talk about um, some tips about freezing and about batch cooking um, and also some just talking about different recipes. So thanks, Penny. We've moved to the next slide. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a few areas about freezing that it, you know it's important to cover. So the first thing I first thing I've written up there, my first tip is a lot of it's to do with preparation. So imagine if you've made we'll stick to the bolognese story. Imagine if we've made a stack of bolognese and you throw the whole lot in one big um, container in the freezer and you. You only want to, you know, feed one or two people at a time. If you've got this massive, big chunk of frozen bolognese, you can't take off a little bit when you need it. So do your work up front. Put things in small individual portions, or portions for your people, or portions for your children's meals. Just portion it before you freeze it, because that will just make make it so much more usable. So I've given a few tips there. I've said slice your loaves before freezing. Like we we often buy a Turkish bread, and I'll just slice it up into you know five or something six pieces and then freeze that because again it's very hard to chop that up when it's frozen. Uh, pack your food in usable size portions and you can do it in you can use plastic containers. I use a lot of Ziploc bags. I find they work really well because you've got room, you've got that little strip to write down the contents of the of the bag and also you can put the date on too. Um, said to pack your food flat or thin, and I've shown that picture there, which is a you know, super, super anally organised freezer that I don't imagine anyone has a freezer looking like that. <laughs> but it's, it's a good example. If anyone have one like that? Please say yes on the comments because I, I'll give you a bit of a high five, an imaginary high five. Um, but anyway, what I wanted to point out is if you pack your stuff nice and thin, two things happen. One, it freezes really quickly which is good for the food, it's, you know, the, the whole chemical side of things with ice crystals and stuff, it will freeze, freeze quickly, but also it's much faster for defrosting, so you don't have to worry about you know, having this frozen thing that just won't defrost. So yeah, pack your things nice and thin if you can. And that goes for things like buying sausages, you know, say if you buy a stack of sausages, try and spread them out and then package them up so that they're just one layer and you know, schnitzels and all sorts of things. If you can keep it thin, it just works it a lot easier. Uh, I mentioned freezing baby food in ice cube trays. Most people know about that one, but it's a good one for small, tiny baby food. So what you would do is put your baby food in the ice, in the ice cube tray, freeze it. Then when they're frozen, you just pop them out and put them in a Ziploc bag or another container back in the freezer. And then you can write on the bag what the contents are because everything looks the same when it's frozen. All those little cubes, you won't have, you won't have a clue what you're giving a child. It, you could be giving them pureed apricot with tin corn. So not a good combination. Um, what, and then taking it the next step further, for your toddler food, what I used to do was I would um, get them regular enough and train and get one of those packets of cheap and nasty little sandwich bags. You, you can normally get 150 sandwich bags for about a dollar. So I would, um, yeah, I would pop those little sandwich bags in the holes of the muffin tray, scoop in whatever it was, with back to the bolognese, scoop in one big spoon of bolognese in each, loosely twist the tops of the plastic bags and then freeze the whole lot. And when they were frozen, I would then pull them all out of the tray and bag them up again. And I just found that Todd, that was just a perfect size portion for a toddler. So we, ha you know, we were at the stage once where we had um, a baby having the puree, a toddler having their own little thing, and the older child wanting to eat something like mum and dad. So it just made our life just a bit easier, pulling all these different things out of the freezer. So a bit, a bit of work up front, but you will be grateful for it down the track. 
Um, Susan, um, I've just. Can you, you can go to the yeah. So before yeah. we do, I've just got a question from one of the girls. Um, when you when you you know are cooking, do you do batch cooking? Um, do you spend the day cooking, or do you do do you double the recipes so you do have leftovers? Yep. Yeah. I don't really have time to have a day of cooking, and I mm. tend to not to do that anyway. I prefer to spread it out. Um, I would often do a double of something. So these days, at the moment, with my you know new world of working full time, um, every weekend I make an effort to have one recipe. I've done a double batch of that recipe, yep. and those that food might not actually be in our menu plan for the next week, but it's in the freezer on rota it's just there for rotation. So I just think every weekend I make at least two dinners, then then there's going to be a supply there, and keep mixing it up. Um, yep. You know, when I wasn't working full time, I often made a double of everything anyway. So it would be dinner that night, and then a spare one in the freezer. Yep. No, that. What was the other question? Oh no, that was it. Um, I I do a similar thing in that um, I do a double batch of you know the spaghetti bolognese or the lasagna or whatever it might be and if I do have time I like to spend a couple of hours on a Sunday afternoon pottering around and um, prepping a couple of meals as well but usually if I've only got the time if we don't have anything on because I find that helps get it frozen ready especially if I know that I've got a couple of nights out which I do this week for work I wish it was for something else but um, you know if I know I'm out tomorrow night and I know I'm out on Thursday night as well then I cook for that night and I freeze that and have that ready to go for the boys so um, when my husband comes home he can just take it straight out and put it in the microwave. I also had, um, I went to a Tupperware party on Saturday night because that's what my Saturday nights are like now it seems and Tupperware have got a um, product where they have um, clips or covers over the top of their ice cube trays. Um, they, they're a little bit pricey. I think they were up around the $40 mark for two ice cube trays, but they were really high quality, obviously, being Tupperware. Um, but the cover on it um, obviously allows you to not spill it when you're taking it to the freezer um, and also to stop weird things falling into your ice cube trays if anybody's ever had a weird thing like crumbs or other bits and pieces from your freezer falling into the ice cube tray. But I thought that was a really good um, good product to use as well. So just moving on to the next slide. I'll just back to your update, those Tupperware ice cube trays. I haven't seen them, but I, I can picture it. Mm -hmm. And another thing is I remember I would freeze I freeze Mrs. Baby's food, but also now if I'm freezing something like pesto, I'll make a big batch of pesto and I freeze that in ice cube trays and I pop it in the freezer and then forget about it. And so, you know, I kept meaning to go down to the freezer and pull it out and pop them all out and put them in a bag but never got around to it. You know, we're not perfect. And so things often, it, because that's exposed to the air, mm. the top of it will sort of go a bit, bit funny and a bit grey or a bit white or something. So at least with that Tupperware one, you've got a lid on it so it's airtight. So that would actually be really a good feature for that sort of thing. Yeah, they, it was great. It looked really good. I'm pretty sure that there was two for $40. So, um, you know, I'm sure you jump online and you can get it through there. Yeah. Okay, I'll just, it's not on the slide, but I'll just quickly mention freezer burn because people often ask about that. Mm -hmm. So all freezer burn is, it's just exposure to the air. So that's why, you know, people always tell you to wrap things up, put things in containers, put things in bags. But just it's getting rid of the, the cold air and just, just any air will um, will prevent that freeze burn. But, and if you do have food with freezer burn, it's there's nothing wrong with it. You can still eat it. It's just going to have a funny texture. So say if you had some old meat um, in the freezer, so I'm, I'm digressing here, but I'll tell you another thing about freezer that's quite important. Um, if you've got some old meat in the freezer, you can still use it. It might just be a bit funny looking, but throw it into a casserole or somewhere so it's not wasted. And um, and then it will sort of mask any you know if it has gone a, gone a bit funny on the outside from freezer burn. I wouldn't do that with a steak on the barbecue, but throw it in a casserole and you wouldn't really know. Um, and so yeah, that's the next thing that I'm progressing with is talking about things in the freezer, how long you can store stuff. There are um, guides on how long you can store your food in the freezer, but one eureka moment I found when I was researching all this stuff was. You know, I was thinking, oh dear, you know, we're in a 
society that loves to, you know, have legal cases and someone's going to get food poisoning from one of my recipes and I'm going to, I'm going to get sued or something. And I found out that food in the freezer, as long as your freezer is operating properly and the, the normal temperature is minus 18 degrees, and you can get thermometers that check your freezing temperature. Um, as long as your freezer is operating at its normal temperature, you can have food in there for huge amounts of time. And even if it exceeds the time that's recommended, it's still going to be safe for it. It's just going to lose some of the qualities like um, the texture, the colour, nutritional qualities, things like that. Um, it's, they, they will they will um, deteriorate, but you won't get sick. So you can have meat from five years ago in the freezer and you can still eat it and it's not going to make you sick. It's just going to be a little bit probably chewy. <laughs> but you could still eat it. Susan, I've, I've got a anyway. question. Sorry, Susan, I've just got one more question um, before we go on to the next slide. Actually, it's from Margaret, who I should um, mention. Margaret um, is the founder of Healthy Chart, who's actually sponsoring tonight's webinar. So thank you very much, Margaret. Her question was... Um, uh, she often gets freezer burnt, well she doesn't, but her food often gets freezer burnt when um, she's wrapped something in foil. So should food be wrapped in baking paper first and then foil? What would you recommend? Uh, I just think with foil you still get some air in there. So um, I, I tend to use the cling wrap, lab wrap. Uh, that seems to, seems to be fine for me. Um, the purists in America, because I've had people comment on Amazon on my book or something, saying, "I didn't say you have. I didn't say you should wrap things twice." Because in America, they think you have to wrap everything twice. <laughs> um, I don't know if we've got any Americans on the line, but they do seem to have that sort of um, thrust at them a fair bit. So, yeah, double wrap if you cling wrap if you really want to be, um, you know, extra careful. But I think cling cling wrap works fine. You could use the foil and then just do a cling wrap over the top if you wanted to. That would be fun. Okay. Right, um, no more questions. We'll keep going. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, sec the next slide that Penny has popped up is um, my other one about my second tip, which is freezing quickly and defrosting slowly. These are key for making your food taste the same. So freezing quickly means, um, yeah, just don't... Just don't leave it sitting on the bench. Put it in the in the fridge to get it cold. Then went from then put from the cold into the freezer. If you put your warm food in the freezer, then there's a few problems with that. Firstly, it's going to bring down the performance of your freezer because you're adding something hot in there. But also, you'll probably start to defrost the food that's around it, and that's not really what you want to do. So um, try make sure things are cold before they go in the freezer. Um, what they often recommend is, say if you have a large freezer and you're, you're putting a lot of food in, try and spread it out so you have something on each shelf. Just spread it around so you've got lots more holes there circulating and that will help food freeze quickly. Then once it's all circulated, so once it's all frozen, then you pack it in really solidly and then it all sort of keeps everything cold. It all, it all just keeps each other cold. Um, second part, which is the whole defrosting slowly part, this is the main part, if you ask me. If you want your food to taste the same after freezing, it's all about the defrosting. The problem is um, we're all in a rush and we all blast in the microwave on high because we're a bit impatient. I mean, I'm guilty of that sometimes too, but I'm, I'm trying to educate myself. If you, if you want your food to taste the same, give it longer. If you have to use your microwave, then why not use the defrost feature or put it on a 25% um, you know, strength. So as long as it's slower, it's going to be much kinder to your food. You, you know, you put the effort in to cook it. Why not, you know, make it at the end? Um, so yeah, defrost slowly. Generally, put stuff in the fridge if you can remember to pull, pull it out the night before. Um, but if you if you've ever tried defrosting a massive leg of lamb or something, you'll realise that it's going to be four days in the fridge to defrost. So. Um, I do sometimes say in the book, in my books, um, you can sort of kickstart the defrosting on the kitchen bench, but then don't forget about it. Don't just leave it there and then suddenly it's completely get too warm or anything. And I've also said some foods can be cooked from frozen, and that's 
that's super handy for um, you know, obviously if you're in a rush, but also if people pop in unexpectedly and you want to suddenly look like you know Nigella Lawson and have freshly baked biscuits. <laughs> All sorts of things that are small or thin. So, rolls from the supermarket for your kids' party and cook them from frozen because that's what the instructions say to do. So that's that's what I'm talking about. If you are doing food for your kids' party, why don't you make your own sausage rolls, which will taste nicer and you look, you know, better as a mum. Um, so yeah, frozen sausage rolls straight on the tray, straight in the oven, and cook them from frozen. Or with cookie dough, I often make up cookie dough and make the balls. And cook the balls, I might put if I'm not if I don't need the whole batch, I'll cook some, freeze the rest of the balls, and then just throw them in a in a Ziploc bag when they're frozen. And um, and then those little balls I can cook from frozen. When people do show up and I just want to have, um, you know, a dozen biscuits for unexpected visitors. And things like pizza, if you think about that, frozen pizzas at the supermarket, they're thin and they all cook from frozen. So, you know, just use your head, use, use some logic and common sense. So, um, yeah, why not cook from frozen if you can get away with it? Um, can we move down to the next one? Yep, absolutely. I've just lost my control panel um, for some reason, ladies. I'm sorry, so I can't see the questions coming in. So if you, you keep going, Susan, and I'll keep trying to get it back, yep. and I'll, I'll ask questions if I need to. <laughs> sure. Um, so I've said, um, obviously you need to be prepared. You need to know about freezing quickly and defrosting slowly. But I guess one of the main things is know what you can freeze because a lot of people mm -hmm. don't. Um, they don't know, or they're just they're just too afraid of you know they don't want to waste money, they don't want to or waste time. They've cooked something, they don't want to put it in the freezer and find that it's ruined. Um, so here's a here's a good list of all sorts of different things that you can freeze. And this is these I've got recipes in my books, I've got recipes on my blog and website. Um, but you don't have to use frostbite stuff. I'm here educating you to use your own recipes because you probably all have plenty of casseroles and soups and pastas and all sorts of things. You don't need a frostbite recipe. Um, so just you know, just experiment. If, you, uh, if you're not sure, one of the easiest ways to, to find out is just get a very small portion of something. Just um, freeze a, a small portion of a, of a sauce or something and then see how that turns out and you haven't really wasted too much, too much resources if you know, if it doesn't work out, and you probably will be surprised because it's quite staggering how many different types of foods can freeze. So up there I've written things like casseroles and curries and things. Even creamy things work fine. They may look a little bit funny when they're defrosted. They might look a bit curdled, but all you need to do is just give them a big stir. Mm -hmm. And also once you've reheated it, they look fine again. So things when they're cold don't look very good, but when they're hot, they look fine. So same goes for soup. If you have creamy soups, they, they normally freeze well too. Uh, pasta sauces, which is your good old standard bolognese, but it's also other things, creamy pasta sauces. Um, pasta baked from lasagnas, so you can cook them. You can, have, you can have them cooked or uncooked in the freezer, whatever suits you. You can have um, things like your pizzas, homemade pizzas. You can make the pizza dough. Uh, you can make tarts and quiches, all those sorts of things. They, they freeze really well, and um, mentions, I've also mentioned meatballs and meatloaf. That's um, those sorts of things freeze really well with your meats. Stuff like mince meat is so hearty and, and cheap, which is great for families when you need to feed a lot of people. So, um, so yeah, some recipes that use mince meat are, you know, they normally freeze really well. It's not like a, you know, beautiful piece of fillet beef that you um, that you spent more money on and it may not be the so sometimes stick to the, the minced meat recipes. Breads and scones freeze really well, so we have masses of bread in our freezer, we have all sorts of types of bread. Um, scones, you know, you can make your own or you can buy stuff at the supermarket on sale. Muffins, the same sort of thing. Different pies and pastries, like we have pie recipes, like a, especially in winter, it's um, in pie. So you can actually make a full pie up if you want to with the pie tin and all the pastry. But that takes up more space and also you might not 
had the time to make the pie. You've, you've spent you know, a fair bit of time making the filling. You couldn't be bothered doing more cooking and making the pie. So why not make the filling, bag that up, or put that in containers in the freezer? Because it doesn't take much effort on the day of eating to mm -hmm. assemble the pie. So that's what I often do. I often have a Ziploc bag and it'll say chili chicken pie filling. So I know um, I can make it pretty quickly when I need to. Uh, pancakes and waffles freeze really well. Um, you know, you probably wouldn't go and make a whole batch of pancakes just to freeze, but it's great to know if you, say, if you live by yourself and you feel like pancakes, you can, because you can just freeze the leftovers. Or you can make a lot of pancakes and freeze the leftovers for, um, for lunch boxes. That's what we often do. We put, you know, small pancakes in for morning teas, just for a variety. Um, cakes and biscuits, slices and brownies, they generally all freeze really, really well. Um, great to know if you want to, you know, if you've made a whole cake and you don't eat it all and you think, this is, this is me talking actually. I know if I had a whole cake, I would want to eat it all <laughs> and I'd regret it afterwards and I don't like food going off and going stale. So the freezer was, you know, it's a bit of a, um, an eye-opener for me in that regard. I, can, I now would freeze the leftover cake and then you have um, cake whenever you want it or cake when pop, people pop in. It also makes fantastic gifts. So say if you've got a friend who's just had a baby, um, you know, it's so lovely to give them a bag of frozen cookie dough or um, some frozen slices and biscuits and cakes or whatever because then they've got stuff mm -hmm. and people pop in and they appreciate that. And lastly, I've... Or even your own lunches or your husband's lunches, and just having some things in the freezer can make make the mornings just a little bit easier. And um, that so moves on to the next slide, which should be Penny. Can you mull it down? Please? Yep, sure thing. Before um before you go on to the ones that don't freeze well, can I ask you about a couple of yeah. um things? So you've got pasta sauces in there. What about white sauce or bechamel sauce? Um, does that freeze okay? Yeah. Yep. Oh, good. Okay. Yep, that um, freeze as well. And also, I make um, banana pikelets. Um, if you've got fruit in um, things like pikelets or bread, you know, banana bread obviously is okay, but that that's still okay with the banana pancakes or banana pikelets? Yep. Okay. Yep, yep, definitely. I, I, I have, um, I make banana pancakes myself and they freeze really well. Mm -hmm. um, as you'll see on the slide that's on the screen right now, it tells you, a few things to avoid. Yep. So say with muffins, raspberries freeze really well. Again, use your logic. Think about what you see at the supermarket. You always see frozen raspberries and frozen blueberries, but you yep. never really see frozen strawberries. Mm -hmm. So a strawberry muffin would be a bit funny, <laughs> but you, yeah, your raspberries and your um, blueberries would be fine. And banana breads, they freeze beautifully, so um, banana pancakes would be fine as well. Okay. And apples, apples do really well too. Like you can make an apple crumble and have that in your freezer. So um, it's really good, you know, to use up lots of excess mm. uh, excess food, uh, mm. fruit and veg too. So I actually picked a whole stack of lemons the other day from my sister's house. So I'm going to make some make a lemon cake. So you know, it's just good to use up those things when you don't really know what to do with them. Yep. So um, if there's no other questions, I'll keep going. Uh, so the next. Green talks about stuff to avoid because there are a few things to avoid, but as you can see, there's not that many. So, um, you know, go to town. There's so many things that you can cook and freeze. We just sort of have gotten a bit too scared. But the few things to avoid are stuff like salad vegetables because, you know, they're going to be, you can, you can just picture it. You know, mm. frozen lettuce is not really very attractive. <laughs> um, so, so all those things won't freeze well, but, you, but there's a few surprises like, Tomatoes. I've um, slow roasted tomatoes and had some, you know, too many of them, and froze them. And they looked a bit sad when they were defrosted. But you put them back in the oven and warm them up a bit, and they were just the same. So some things are surprisingly fine. Mayonnaises and cottage cheeses don't freeze too well. They sort of separate. Um, they might and watery. So avoid recipes that use those. If you wanted to put mayonnaise on a sandwich, say you're doing a chicken mayo sandwich. You could smear it a little bit, that would be fine, but um, you know, just not too much. Potatoes is a bit of a, an iffy one, and people are very divided about it. And um, 
I tend to avoid them. I think they, they sort of go a bit funny, the texture changes. If you have potatoes in a casserole or say a, a musselman curry where you have potato, mm -hmm. they kind of go a bit spongy and so I, I avoid them, but some people say it's fine. Uh, boiled eggs don't freeze very well, but egg whites, raw egg whites freeze really well. So say if you're making, if you make custard or anything that you stuff with lots of yolks and you don't know what to do with your whites, freeze the whites and, and I just, I freeze them in little bags. I just write on the outside one or two so I know how many egg whites are in that bag and then, um, then you, you wait till you have the right number of egg whites to make meringues or pavlovas or whatever. Our uh, next thing on the list was strawberries. Yeah, for some reason they just don't seem to freeze that well. And gelatin. So if you, um, I think, you know, trying to think of an example recipe with gelatin, maybe a slice that had marshmallow with gelatin in it or something, I'd, I'd avoid those ones too because they just don't quite work. If you're not too sure, like I said, just freeze one piece of that slice and see what happens. And <laughs> you, might be, you might prove me wrong. Okay, so that's um, that's those those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I think moving down, Penny, we're talking. Penny wanted me to give a case study of um, of how you know someone meal plans, and I said, well, I'm I'm living, breathing this right now. I've always cooked and frozen, but I'm I am my poster child right now. <laughs> so, so this is this is just a quick summary of how I go about my planning of my my meals. Um, if you ask me what's for dinner tomorrow night, I get a blank. I can't think of what I like to cook. I can't think of what we like to eat. So I, it's one of those strange things that just drives me bonkers. I can't remember anything. So I make lists. So I have a nice big list that has all the sorts of meals that we generally eat, stuff that um, that suits everyone in my family. We're, my youngest is six, so we're, we're all pretty, you know, we're eating normal food now. We're not, we're not worried about baby stuff or anything anymore. Um, but we still have, you know, not a huge list, but that's what it's like with children. You, you know, they tend to be a bit fussy. So we have a, a list of all the different types of food that we eat. I also have a small list that would just be things that Luke and I like to eat because um, sometimes you get the occasion when it's just you guys eating or you know, the kids, you know, they tend to eat something straight from the freezer like fish fingers. <laughs> um, then on those lists, I would then sort of earmark a few different things. I would like maybe like a little asterisk system to say which ones of those of those meals can be made ahead of frozen, so I you know sort of know visually I can see pretty quickly what stuff I could be making on the weekend. Um, and then obviously by default everything else is pretty much meals that needed to be made on the day of eating. Then also um, I have on that list a few a few shortcuts because everyone needs a few shortcuts. Uh, I tend not to. I tend to make things from scratch. I like to know what ingredients have gone in, um, and also, I, you know, food snob in me says that some of those shortcuts don't taste too good. But um, I've managed to uncover a few goodies, and um, you can see them there. You can see a picture of Marion's lovely smiley face from Master Chef. I don't know which season that was, <laughs> but um, the pad thai is amazing. It's, it tastes just like the Thai restaurant. So, uh, and you pretty much have everything you need for it. You just um, you just need an egg, and you need some, and need some chicken or prawn. So I would, I'd have a packet of chicken in the freezer, like a 500 gram you know, tray of chicken, just so I knew I'd have that in the pantry, the box in the pantry, and the chicken in the freezer, and, and I knew I could make up that one and throw in extra veggies. It's always good. Susan, um, can I can I interrupt you there? Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. told us about Marion's Kitchen products at the Working uh, Mums Masterclass event in yeah. April. So that following week, I thought, oh, I'll give this a try. I put it on my um, shopping list, and I think it was the green – oh, no, I think it was the pad thai that we got, um, and it was fantastic. So the next week, I thought I'll try the green curry, and the week after that, we tried the red curry, and it is so easy. The packaging is just brilliant. If you've got, you know, the chicken on hand and just, like you said, a couple of those extra veggies, and um, it's a good way for using up your veggies as well. The green curry took me about 15 minutes to, to make the other too night. Spicy? Sorry? Was it too spicy? Too oh, spicy? it was so spicy. So what I've done is um, I take the chilies, the dry chilies out of the um, dried um, herbs and chili thing and I cut one of the chilies and only use about a quarter of it. 
spicy. It was still spicy, but it didn't blow all of our heads off, which was a positive. Yes, that's a good one. Yeah, so um, I, I think I should be on commission from Marion now. Mm. I'm telling people about that one. You should do. Uh, but just now, sometimes, like I always say, we call it Friday night food. Sometimes on a Friday night, you don't want to have your boring stir fries and pasta and your same old, same old. So it's good to have a few recipes that are that feel a bit like a takeaway or a bit sort of a bit more fun. So pad thai might fall in that category for you. Mm -hmm. um, the other little picture you can see is the Master Foods slow cooker lamb shanks. Um, the reason I put that on there is I was up, I was up at a local supermarket just before I started working full time, and I ran into a, a friend from school, one of the mums from school, and she had all these Master Foods slow cooker things in her basket and she was a bit embarrassed and she said she was on a, um, it was like a food waster because there was a family at school and uh, father was having chemotherapy so mm -hmm. everyone was making dinners for them and she made, she must have made these lamb shanks for him because every time her name was on the roster he kept <laughs> requesting the lamb shanks <laughs> and then at the end when he was better he asked for the recipe so <laughs> she had to fess up and admit that it was actually the easiest cheap thing you could do. Um, and again, I what I would do is I would buy lamb shanks from the butcher and there's a butcher near me in Sydney that does great lamb shanks where they trim them down so they're quite nice. They're not these big, meaty, dog bone looking things. Uh, so if you can find a butcher to do that, that's great. So I'll keep them. I think that's safe. I'm easy. And then I've also said my other shortcut is the ready-made meals from the butcher. Now here, if, um, you know, I've seen plenty of butchers where their meat looks pretty scary and, well, the meat's fine probably, but they, they smother everything in a bottle sauce from somewhere or other and it looks like it's full of preservatives and, and um, I don't know, emulsifiers and I don't know what else is in them. But there's a butcher near me and where they make beautiful marinades, um, they make all sorts of different skewers and you know, sometimes those chicken skewers where the meat is very square, it just makes me wonder what kind of chicken that came from. <laughs> but these are nice chicken skewers that look like it came from a chicken and all sorts of different things. Um, so I buy a few different bits and pieces from the butcher and have them in my freezer too because you know all you need to do is pan fry the vegetables and make some vegetables or um, just barbecue the, the skewers. And so it's, again, a nice quick one without having to... Um, you know, cook something from scratch and you don't have to have another thing to add to your weekend cooking. Uh, you've got a meal taken care of from the butcher. Um, so yeah, so that's the first, the first two sections of that slide. I've also said, um, so what I do is I've, I've got that big list of the different meals we eat. I know which stuff can be made ahead and frozen and which ones can't. Then I map out our week. I, I think the next slide will show you what I call our monster spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. uh, we ha Oh, here we go. There's my monster spreadsheet. Um, well, that's only two days of the monster spreadsheet. So I find, um, well, before, we, before I started working, I thought, you know, I need to document everything that we're doing. We need to know what school uniforms we're in, who has guides, who has netball, who has violin, who has day or... Uh, I also needed to... Uh, clock down the hours. We have, an, we have an au pair living with us. That's um, the new thing that's started since, we, since I started working. So we have a, a lovely 21-year-old girl from New Zealand and she's living with us and she helps out just in the mornings and in the afternoons. Um, and so you can see on the spreadsheet that says planned hours for AJ, our au pair. Um, anyway, so I knew I needed to have a few things. I needed to have a list of what was happening. I needed to document what hours so I thought, let's just pull it all together and have a massive um, spreadsheet that covers everything and we all know where to look when we need to know what's going on. So I would create a spreadsheet every weekend and um, jot down, like you can see, Luke, my husband, is in Canberra overnight for that on the Thursday. So I know I know to be in town or how many people we're feeding. I know if we've got guides so we, we don't have time to cook. Uh, so I use that to sort of figure out what kind of meals we need just because, um, yeah, because you need to sort of tailor your meals around what's going on with the family. 
um, yeah, it may be maybe over the top. Some people probably couldn't handle, you know, <laughs> having some spreadsheets like that, but it makes our life easier. The au pair loves it. She knows what's going on. She knows what, what, um, um, yeah, and next slide. Okay, um, before we go on, I've just got a couple of questions and while I'm, um, while I ask the question and you answer, I'm just going to, um, jump out of this PowerPoint to see if I can get the control panel back again so I can see the girls' questions. So you'll probably see then some things flip around on your screen, so don't worry about it. Um, if I can't find it, I'll just go straight back into it. So you were talking about um, spreadsheets, and to me, I, I can't exist without spreadsheets. It helps me um, get a whole lot less stressed. There we go. I've got it back again. That's brilliant. Um, but how do you actually... Um, display your spreadsheets? Where do you put them um, so the family can see them? Um, well, what we, we tend to, I just print it out, it's two pages for the week and I've got a, I've, I used to put stuff on the fridge but I've decided since we have an au pair, I'll keep it in a folder so we've got the history as well if we ever need to look back on something and also in that folder I can keep other things like phone listings, um, I can put down instructions because slowly over time I'm typing up more and more instructions because we have we have a new au pair coming next month because our Kiwi girl has to go. So I thought, oh, God, I have to show her how to use the washing machine. So I'm starting to type up instructions. So this poor next girl is going to get hit with a massive pile of paper <laughs> and she'll run around the house trying to figure out how everything works. But that's just me. I would prefer to do that um, and laugh it off and hopefully... It's hopefully the iPad. I think she's moved in with a bunch of lunatics. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's what we do. We have it in a folder because that way everything's um, in one spot. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to... Um, I'm pretty close to the end. This is actually my sort of my last main slide. So I wanted to point out when, um, you know, the times that you can actually use your freezer because we tend to think of it just for dinner time but there's so many other times where it can come to your rescue and um, and we should all be using that lot of meat to find a square and, and hopefully you can make it make your life a bit easier. A lot of people get crazy in cooking before their babies arrive and that's that's fantastic. So um, cook before the arrival of the baby. You can even cook before the arrival of your friend's baby. I have some twins twins and um, she was not the most organised person, so I thought I'd cook her meals before the babies can happen, so um, that's always handy. Um, cook before surgery. I know my years ago my mother was having some hip replacement, I think, and lots and lots of dinner before she was surgery. Um, I said freezing's great for things and couples, so if you're just two people in the house, it's fantastic to cook a recipe for four people, and then you've got tonight's dinner and another night's dinner up your sleeve. Um, and also, don't forget housing, you know, Family sizes are getting smaller, so I think this is more and more relevant. Also, um, great option for teenagers. If you've got teenagers that come in after footy training and they're just ravenous, it's um, nice to have some different things that they can pull out of the freezer. Uh, I said cook for your friend who's had a baby or moving house or chemo or difficult time. Or There's so many reasons why we need to support our family and our friends and our neighbours because, um, you know, Hopefully it'll never happen to us, but if, if something terrible was happening in your life, it would be nice to know people looked out for you too. So, yeah, jump right in and cook for friends because they won't ask you to cook, but do it. Or um, go and you know, mow their lawn, do something. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's funny you say that, Susan, because we, we've had um, our four-year-old's been in and out of hospital for the, the last, or since January because of a, um, an interesting condition that he has. And when he was in the first time, it was for three weeks. And life has to go on. And it got to, it, it actually got to the point where I just put a note out on Facebook and went, look, this is really hard for me to do, but I need help. Can people drop stuff over to us please because we were just we were struggling so bad um so badly i should say and the amazing food that arrived on our doorstep and most of it was food that we could freeze and because he was in our in and out of hospital um over the following months and it was 
quite often very unexpected. It would He would come down with his condition and have to go straight back in again. Just knowing that we had some uh, lamb shanks in the freezer or we had some green curry that somebody had made up in the freezer was such a huge relief for us or me knowing that I was staying in in the hospital for a few nights and knowing that my husband and my other son was going to be able to eat well instead of having to go to you know um, hungry jacks or something like that so and the, the more you can do that the, the better I think yeah definitely um, I think at the the working mums masterclass I told um, everyone about the, the lady who lives across the street from me yeah she's, um, she's a single mum and she's a bit older than me and she has a nine-year-old son and I mean so much of a single mum, there's no father on the birth certificate, it's just her with her child. And she found out she had breast cancer. So, I mean, obviously her life was just chaos. And she didn't have a whole lot of family support. Not only that, but her doctor had suggested that she um, she change the way she eats and drinks because that would, you know, give her the better chance to get through it all. So, you know, she ruled out everything pretty much. There was no meat, there was no dairy, there was no... Um, gluten, there was no alcohol, um, I mean the list was endless. Mm -hmm. They also suggested that if she pureed her food it would make it easier on her digestion system. So basically all she could have was pureed vegetable soup. Mm -hmm. So um, I had a few different vegetable soups which I'd make and freeze for her but she, I mean, she was quite happy to eat the same old thing because she knew it was pretty restrictive. But the main area where I helped her was I thought she's got this nine-year-old son and he's not going to want to have pureed vegetable soup every night. Mm. So I thought, you know, I'm feeding three kids. I can just do a little portion for him. So I had lots of little aluminium trays and stuff, just making meals for Daniel. And I, you know, every week or so I'd run over with a couple of new containers and pop them in a freezer. And it was no extra effort for us, mm. just one child's meal. But it made such a difference to her. And... And with yeah, I mean, I wasn't doing it for a pat on the back, but you you feel great when you're helping people, and yeah. you know that they you, they are so so grateful. So it's cooked for people, cooking it and stuff. Um, moving on to the next point, I said completely. You know, this is all back to normal selfish world. Um, <laughs> cook, cook on your cook for your holidays. Uh, we're actually going up to the Blue Mountains in uh, near Sydney in the school holidays, so I'm going to have some um, cook some things and pop them in the freezer take to the Blue Mountains because, you know, when you're on holidays, you, you want to eat well, but you don't really want to have barbecues every night and takeaway every night and, um, you know, using a four-ingredient recipe from the supermarket. So cook for your holidays. That's, um, it makes your holidays so much more enjoyable. I say um, why not cook for when you're entertaining on the weekend. So when we have a dinner party on Saturday night, um, you know, our Saturdays are crazy with netball games and anything else. So I'll often make, uh, say, the dessert or, um, or main course. I'll make something in advance so at least part of the meal is done. And not just the cooking but the washing up too. You've got one thing out of the way mm. so you just um, you can enjoy that Saturday so much more. Uh, I think to, why not freeze your cocktail parties? You know, we've had some big parties in our house um, <laughs> and I freeze lots of finger foods and then... You just yeah, it just works so well. We've had I've made lots and lots of finger foods for um, my husband's work at a Christmas party here, and we lined up some teenage girls who are ba who babysit for us, and they just kept throwing tray after tray in the oven, and then and then passed all the food around, and it was so easy. And mm -hmm. but it was all homemade, and everyone you know everyone loves it. I said uh, cook and freeze your lunch boxes for yourself and for your kids. Freeze your leftover cakes and biscuits so you don't eat like, you know, eat like a crazy pregnant woman. Um, I said use produce that's in season. So, you know, like you have too many lemons, too many oranges, or lambs on sale, whatever the reason. Um, that's when you can cook and freeze those things. And I've also said freeze party food for your parties, your kids' parties. So you can see in those pictures, the bottom one is the Mars Bar Marshmallow Spice, Yum. which, um, is, yeah, it's good and it's easy <laughs> and it looks pretty and... Everyone loves it. It's on. The, it's from the book, but it's actually also on the blog and the website. And I think that photo has been my most um, tagged and copied and pinned photo <laughs> on Pinterest. Um, and the picture above is not my uh, photo. It's something I did find on Pinterest, mm -hmm. which was a box of frozen cookie dough balls, which was saying would make a great gift. Yeah, they look right. cute. 
very cute. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, use your freezer. Don't um, let's not be martyrs. Let's try and be sensible and make it work for us. I've got a question what from um. Yeah, I've just got a question from Cassie who's just asked about meat. Do you recommend taking the meat out of the supermarket, wrapping and uh, re-wrapping it? No, unless you've bought a lot. Like say if you bought something in bulk, um, I would. if I did buy a lot of something, I would divide it into portions that were usable and then repackage them. But if it's just 500 grams of chicken, I would just put that straight in the freezer. Yep. Okay, great. All right. So this is where we can find you? Yeah, that's where you can find me on social media times. <laughs> well, you just dropped out slightly there, so um, I'll just repeat it for the guys. So frostbitefood.blogspot.com, um, and you've got your lists of recipes there as well, um, I've seen, because I spend a bit of time in there. Facebook.com, Frostbite Food, and on Pinterest, uh, Frostbite Book, and on Twitter, at Frostbite Food 2. Um, so I just wanted to um, say as well, these are two um, resources that I use in relation to meal planning and they are cheap as chips. The Inner Bee Weekly Menu Planner Notepad is only $6.95. You can get it online um, at innerbee.com.au and uh, I think postage and handling isn't much more than that. But the thing that I like about that Weekly Menu Planner is that it actually has the meal planner on the left hand side and the shopping list on the right hand side and it's perforated so you can rip off the shopping list um, and take it separately or rip off the menu planner and stick it up on your calendar or your pin board or whatever it might be so I find that product really helpful and also um, Nick Avery from Planning with Clid, uh, Clids <laughs> from Planning with Kids um, has um, created a, a smartphone app um, which is a meal planner smartphone app too. So if you go to her website on planningwithkids.com.au, uh, actually it's no AU, planningwithkids.com, it has the link to um, iTunes to download that as well. But, you know, for 99 cents or for 6.95, it's a really simple cost-effective way to get organised. Um, so thank you very much, Susan. Are you still there? I lost your audio for a little bit. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you very much for um, giving up uh, an hour of your time for us tonight. It was, it was really helpful. And like I said um, to you guys, everybody who logged on will pop into a random drawer and I'll announce it tomorrow on the Facebook page um, to win a copy of Susan's book. And it is, as she said at the beginning, it's, the, it's a beautiful product. It's a lovely, big, hard copy gorgeous, happy red um, book. So anyone who wins that will be very happy with that, I'm sure. So keep an eye out um, for the announcement. So thank you very much, Susan. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me, Penny. <laughs> um, and then also just to talk about um, Healthy Chart, who um, Margaret's actually online here as well. Um, this is a wonderful product. I um, bought one from Margaret I don't know, probably about a month ago now it arrived on my doorstep. My four-year-old has been using it and it's just educating him and encouraging him to, you know, understand how many veggies he needs in the day, how much fruit he needs to eat, how much exercise he needs to do in a really positive and fun way. It's a fabulous magnetized chart. Um, so I would thoroughly recommend healthychart.com.au. Head there if you've got a fussy eater. If you don't have a fussy eater, my son's not fussy, but he is just loving it. And he's actually starting to make choices now where he will say, oh, that's not on the chart. I can't, I'm not going to have that. Um, I'll have an apple instead and then I can put a magnet on my chart. So it's a really good um, instigator for, for that sort of thing. Although he tried to get popcorn past me today. He had a little bit of popcorn and then wanted to put the corn on there, but I think the popcorn that we had wasn't really, you know, the traditional corn one <laughs> at all. So head on over to Margaret's website at healthychart.com.au and she's also on website um, on Facebook too. Um, and next month we have um, Angela Council, who was also actually one of our speakers when um, Susan was speaking at the event in Sydney in April. Um, and Angela's a naturopath, qualified naturopath, um, runs a very successful um, 
business on the northern beaches in Sydney and she's going to be talking about basically how we as mums can look after ourselves. So I'll put the details at the end of the week out on Facebook for that for you too. And thank you very much. I really appreciate you giving the time um, to us. Uh, I know how important your time is as a, as a busy mum. Um, when you drop uh, log out of this tonight. There'll be a survey there for you. It'll take you, I tested it um, last time and it took me one minute and 20 seconds. So it should take you about that as well. So we'd appreciate it if you could fill it out because it helps us improve the, um, the um, service and the, the webinars for the future. So thank you very much everybody. I hope you have a, a lovely rest of the week and thank you again Susan. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Penny, and thanks. Help each other. Thanks, guys. See you later.